good to see everybody here. And I'm particularly delighted and even relieved that Achan Barry is uh, with us this evening. I always welcome guest teachers. I always welcome somebody I've known for a long time. Uh, and just by way of sort of um, background and all this business of guest te teachers and this, that and the other, you know, uh, this lunchtime, I walked around, five minute walk around to a local Baptist church and there was somebody there uh, doing mindfulness, an hour of mindfulness, and I wanted to support that. So I was there and there, um, tiny attendants, uh, very sort of well-meaning people. The teacher's a lovely person, and she got into mind. I mean, she's a Baptist, and she got into mindfulness for therapeutic reasons. She suffers from one of these horrible sort of neurological, painful conditions, and has found a lot of benefit from it. And she's, um, I don't know, she's doing a course. Uh, John Kabat-Zinn or somebody like that. Um, and uh, the, the interesting thing is that, uh, yes, yeah, she's been doing a bit of mindfulness. She realizes it's therapeutic benefits. She's got the course and she's sitting there with the course notes. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, so she's sort of, you know, reading the course notes, turning them over. Turning them over. Oh, that's interesting, you know. So she's doing it as best she can, if you like, from her experience, with a bit of help <laughs> I'm John Gavinson. And the, the interesting thing about this, as far as the scene is concerned, is that everybody who sits at the front of a mindfulness class and is leading it really is, is doing it from their own experience. It's as simple as that. And that's why everybody who leads a class, each individual who leads it, you know, maybe says something a little bit different. The core of it is often exactly the same, right? But uh, it's a question of what works, what works for me, what works for Rachel Barry, works for, what works for Linda in the Baptist Church, and all the rest of it. So it's particularly good to have Achan Barry here because he's got a range of experience, actually, that I don't have. Uh, because he's, uh, you know, obviously he's, he's a lay Buddhist, so he's been practicing as a lay Buddhist before he got into Zen Buddhism, did a lot of Zen Buddhism, got experience there, uh, became a Theravadan monk under Achan Sumedha, did that for a long time, back being a lay person. There's a lot of experience there, and I'm really just delighted that he's come along this evening, or zoomed in this evening, to share some of it with us. Um, so I'm going to hand over to him in just a moment, but just sort of ordinary housekeeping issues. Uh, we're all on mute to begin with, and uh, we can unmute... Uh, at the end, because I'm pretty sure there'll be discussion, questions and whatnot at the end. If in the meantime, anybody has uh, a question that they want to ask, or they're having some problems or something like that, if you can, ping it in through in chat. I've got the, my chat window box, whatever you want to call it, open. And in due course, I'll relay, you know, any messages through to Achen Barry. And I know if you've got any questions, I mean, he really wants to hear them. Uh, and you mustn't feel shy about it because if it's your question, it's somebody else's as well, you know. So anyway, without more from me, over to you, uh, Ajahn Barry. Thank you, Colin, and uh, welcome to everybody. Um, well, I'll just get my notes out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, a that's a joke. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as Colin says, I, you know, I uh, firstly, I really try to talk from from my experience. And I try not to. Obviously, it's it's easy to fall into uh, quoting others, um, quoting scripture, etc. But I, I really try not to. Not that there's anything wrong with uh, scripture and other people's. Uh, suggestions, but um, there's really no need to hide behind this stuff. It seems to me that people actually start to hear if you're talking from uh, from your own heart. They start to hear what you're saying because it, it makes sense it's not some abstract intellectual uh, work of uh, whatever I'll just do the uh, small introductory chant paying respects to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha 
namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa buddham danham sangham namasami So uh, most of you here, I, I don't, uh, there's probably one or two names I don't recognize on the screen. Um, and uh, you'll all find out that uh, I'm, I, I'm pretty boring, as in I do the same thing each time, because I think it is supremely important to actually step onto the path of practice, not just to, to grasp at ideas, sayings, other people's words and believing them, but look within, look within. Then these sayings from the scriptures and, and wise people really start to make sense. They really mean something, but not in, a, in an abstract sense. They agree with our own experience. So it puts it, puts it uh, how would you say, it from our experience, our intuitive experience, it puts it into writing, so to speak, into, into understanding. It's like seeing a, a road sign to, uh, to Manchester, say, and uh, the mind is such, because of our conditioning, our views and opinions, that we tend to believe in the signs and think well, yes, I know Manchester. I don't. I know the sign. I know the finger that's pointing in that direction. But once we get to that city, then we truly know what it's like. It's the same with practice. But the <clears throat> our conditioned, well, Mara, who's our deluder, is so powerful that it can can have us believing in our thoughts, in other people's thoughts, views and opinions, in our views and opinions. We grasp at these things, the cause of suffering, attachment to desire, attachment to becoming something else, attachment to getting rid of things we don't like, instead of just being being in the present moment, noticing truly how it is in the present moment. This is important because I'll, I'll do a, a guided sweeping meditation about coming back to the present moment. But it's not actually about the present moment. It's about noticing when we are in the present moment. Noticing, how is it? How is our heart? How is our heart mind in that very moment? If you really notice that when we are present, there is true awareness. Now in that present moment awareness, there are no thoughts dragging us around because we can't be in two places at one time. If we're not in the present moment noticing that awareness, we're lost into views, views and opinions, thoughts. But if we are in that place of open spacious awareness, we just are, we are just being, being, understanding the Dhamma, the true Dhamma. As Lumpur Samedo says, and it's uh, from traditional Theravadan Buddhism, be the Buddha, knowing the Dhamma. Be the one who knows the Buddha, the Dhamma, 
the way it is. Be the Buddha. Don't, this, we can't become the Buddha, but we can know the Buddha. We can know our true nature. Be the Buddha, knowing the Dharma, knowing the way it is right now. In that place of open, spacious awareness. Obviously, it takes practice, continually remembering to come back whenever the mind starts to run around, starts to drag us all over the place, like blown around like a leaf in the wind. But the more we come back, the more we notice that, the more it becomes our default lifestyle or our default, just our default. So we start to respond to life, not react to life. We start to notice a difference in our response instead of our reactions. We start to see, yeah, maybe, maybe things are changing or maybe there is a change. But it's not up to us as individuals. It's a true changing. It's a changing back to our true nature, which is nothing special. It's just ordinary, everyday, open, spacious awareness. Notice when we're, when we're so-called formally meditating, and I say formally, and I'll mention this in a moment. Notice when we are formally meditating, Can anybody find a separate self at that time? If we're present, if we're noticing our true nature, if we're noticing our true meditation, our true consciousness, our true mindfulness, can anybody find that separate self? Can anybody find a problem in that moment? Can anybody find anything that they would, would like to add or subtract from their life? Well, I have never find, met anybody who can tell me they can find these things if they are not projecting a thought, but if they are just coming from that open awareness, our consciousness, there is nothing, there is nothing lacking. But as I say, we need to constantly return. We need to perhaps add punctuation to our life. So we normally do things, we go from one thing to another, we, we don't quite finish one thing properly and we, we leap off and do the next thing and you know, you, you see it often in, uh, if you go on retreats and at the moment the bell goes, people jump up and run off back to whatever they want to do. Take a time, full stop, a comma, just break that cycle. Return. Just notice how we do that. Notice how we, we, we come home in the evening, for instance. So this is just an example. We don't think. We turn the heating on. We turn the heating off. We turn the TV on. We turn the radio on. We don't pause for a second and notice the way it is. Notice that, that desire to get away from things, to make things more comfortable. Nothing wrong with this, but we're driven. 
So adding a little bit of punctuation. Try to have some some form. Try to to med formally meditate before you go to bed. If possible for a longer time, but if it's only five minutes or less, that's something, that's something just to re-establish our awareness before we go to bed. When we're in bed, sweep through the body. Noticing the body, noticing how it is when we are aware. When we wake up in the morning, and if you're anything like me, I don't, I'm not a morning person, although I wake up fairly early. I think, oh, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to wake up. Look, just notice. That's just thoughts. It's just thoughts. It's just habits. But look beyond that. Look to that place of our true awareness. And there is nothing. There is no problem there. So we've, we've returned to that place. We've returned to that knowing, to our true nature. Using whatever, you know, I, I, I used in the past, I used to put post notes up all around the flat to remind myself to, to return. I'm not suggesting you do this, but find ways that might help you if you keep getting caught up in, in your thoughts, views and opinions. Get to know that place. And the more we get to know that place, it's like uh, many of you have probably heard me say this before. <clears throat> I made up this uh, little story of... Uh, we're, we're so used to walking on hot coals. And that's life. It's just the way life is. We, we have to walk on hot coals. It's uncomfortable, but we get on with it. We moan about it at times. It's all right at times. But suddenly through being aware, being mindful, noticing that place, we step onto the grass verge. And that grass verge, oh, that's really cool. It's slightly damp. Well, that's nice. But then through our conditioning, our views and opinions, we go back onto the coals. But the more we practice with this awareness, this true mindfulness, the more we would be on the grass verge. And then why on earth would we go back onto the hot coals when we truly know how it is to be walking comfortably in life. And this was the, the uh, problem I had in, uh, say, the first noble truth, to really know, to really understand suffering. Well, it occurred to me, well, how can I, how can I understand suffering when all I know is suffering. I can't get an objective view because that's all I know. But getting to know this place of no suffering, which is right here, right now, if we are present and aware, getting to know that place, you can see truly what suffering is. Not from some intellectual idea of what suffering is. Yeah, getting old sickness and, and death. Yeah, okay, there's suffering. But we suffer all the time from things not getting our way. Not becoming what we want to become. Not being successful. Whatever. There's a million and one reasons why we suffer. Getting to know that. Getting to know... The causes of suffering, the second noble truth, that attachment to desire, 
nothing wrong with desire, but we attach to it. So when we don't get what we want, we suffer. That attachment to becoming something else, becoming a good meditator, becoming wise, becoming again successful. The attachment to getting rid of things we don't like, the desire to get away from. We start to see things clearly from that place of our true, open, spacious awareness. And practicing with this, we start to actually get to know the third noble truth, which is the cessation of desires of suffering. Because it's right here, right now, if we only look. We don't have to do anything. It's right here, right now, if we, are, if we introspect, if we look within. Knowing that place of no suffering, of the cessation of suffering. Becoming familiar with it. It's, again, that's like walking on the grass verge. Then bringing that into our ordinary everyday life and the Eightfold Path. Right view, right thought, right speech, right action. Every aspect of our life coming from that open, spacious awareness. And then our understanding, our wisdom. This is not a wisdom of how to solve the problems of the world. The physical world this is, not the, san the sangsaric world that we create in our mind. We start to understand that. We start to, to live from a place of wisdom knowing what's causing suffering. Avijja is ignorance. It's ignorance of the Four Noble Truths of Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. When we start to see those truths, not as ideas, but through experience, we live a life of freedom, of freedom from Mara, and that's not getting rid of Mara, it's just seeing through the illusion that Mara has a hold on us. So, I'll give the guided meditation, the sweeping guided meditation. As I say, you know, I might say, be aware of the top of the head or, or be aware of the eyebrows, for instance. I can't be aware of my eyebrows. But when I take my attention in that direction, I can notice how my mind, how my heart mind stops in that moment, stops running around, that is. Stops dragging me around. And there's just awareness. And it's that awareness that the is the important thing to know, not the eyebrows, not the top of the head. These are just, these are just a, a techniques of, of moving the awareness. Instead of trying to, to concentrate on one thing, trying to quieten the mind. We don't need to quieten the mind. It will quiet when we are present. So sitting in a posture that's uh, conducive, helpful, to, to your awareness, so uh, uh, the posture lets you know when, when we start to lose it, <clears throat> when we start to lose our awareness. I'm sure a lot of you have been uh, meditating for a while, but for anybody who hasn't, I suggest that you, uh, now please 
if you have been meditating for a while, you have your own way of practicing. So uh, don't uh, change things if it doesn't suit you. The eyes slitted, not concentrating, not focused, just slitted open slightly, which is helpful. Uh, so we don't just go into a, a dream, easily into a dream state. Hands traditionally together, very lightly, a little bit of light, not tension, but muscle awareness between the hands. If possible, pushing the, uh, the top of the, the crown of the head up slightly. But again, you know, bodies, bodies are different. Um, and not all, all bodies will allow this type of thing. If you're sitting in a chair, absolutely fine. If you're sitting in an armchair, absolutely fine. As they say, uh, mindfulness is in the four postures, sitting, standing, walking, and lying down. and all postures in between. So there really is no uh, time that we cannot be practicing meditation, whether it's formal or informal. Obviously formal is more difficult to find a time to do it, but there is no reason whatsoever that we cannot be aware in our ordinary everyday life. So becoming aware of the body from the tips of the toes to the top of the head. Noticing any feelings, any sensations, not, uh, not commenting on them, not trying to adjust them or wonder about them. Just be aware of them. Becoming aware of the breathing, just the natural, normal breathing, not following the breath, not concentrating on the breath in a particular part, the nose, the nostrils, the throat, the belly, just the normal breathing. Maybe listening in that place of open, spacious awareness. Listen, listen to the sound of silence. Listen to our natural sound. So becoming aware of the top of the head. Becoming aware from that place of spacious openness. If you cannot see the top of the head, find the top of the head. That's, it's neither here nor there. But you can notice how the mind, how the heart mind settles in that moment. Letting that awareness spread down the back of the head and the sides of the head. And the ears, noticing the ears and the earlobes.
They're becoming aware of the forehead and the eyebrows. and the eyes and the nose and the nostrils not projecting pictures but noticing when you shift your awareness, how is the mind, how is the heart mind? And becoming aware of the mouth, the lips, the tongue inside the mouth. And the chin. When the mind wanders, just gently, with true loving kindness, just come back, no commenting. It's the nature of the mind to do it, to wander, but it's not for us to interfere, it's just for us to notice that place of open awareness. Becoming aware of the jaw and the cheeks of the face. Now bringing the whole of our face and head into that open spacious awareness. Not projecting pictures just knowing that spaciousness. You're becoming aware of the neck and the throat. and the shoulders
Letting that awareness spread down from the shoulders, down the arms, to the elbows. The front of the arms, the backs of the arms, the sides of the arms. From the elbows down to the wrists. Noticing any sensations, not grasping them or commenting on them, just knowing them. Now becoming where the hands, the palms of the hands, the thumbs, the fingers, the joints of the fingers, and the tips of the fingers. And the backs of the hands, the knuckles, the fingers, the joints of the fingers, the tips of the fingers and the fingernails. What happens to your mind when you Bring your fingernails into your awareness without projecting pictures or ideas. Is there just open awareness? Now bringing your hands, your arms, your shoulders, the neck, the face and the head into that open, spacious awareness. Or just noticing that spacious awareness. Letting that awareness spread down the back, down the sides of the trunk, down the spine, through the shoulder blades, down the spine. The arch of the back. The small of the back. The coccyx, the buttocks, the hips,
and letting that awareness spread down from the shoulders down the chest and through the rib cage, the sides of the trunk, the diaphragm, the stomach, the belly area, the navel, and through the intestines, through to the groin, and the hips, Now bringing into that open spacious awareness the whole of the trunk of the body from the hips up to the shoulders, the front, the back, the hands, the arms, the neck, the face and the head. Most crucially noticing how is it when we are truly present. Now becoming aware of the legs from the hips down to the knees. Just noticing any feelings, not attaching to them, not commenting on them, just noticing the feelings within that place of awareness. from the knees down to the ankles. And from the ankles down into the feet, down through the Achilles tendons, the heel, the soles of the feet, the arches of the feet, the balls of the feet, the toes, the tips of the toes. And the tops of the feet, the sides of the feet, the toes, the joints of the toes, the tips of the toes, and the toenails. Now bringing the whole of your body from the tips of the toes to the top of the head into that spacious awareness, not concentrating, just being openly aware.
you know, becoming aware of the breath, just the normal gentle breathing. Being aware from that spacious awareness. Or listening, listening to internal sounds, the sound of silence. And noticing when we are present, it is just the way it is, it's just open spacious awareness i'll ring the bell in a short while but please don't think in terms of the meditation coming to an end there really is no reason why we cannot be aware at any point in any action. So stretching the limbs if, if needs be, but always knowing that place of awareness, that place of true presence, getting to know that spacious awareness, which isn't dumb or stupid. I mean, it's not like we're cutting off, we're denying or repressing or suppressing. It is an open awareness. It's not concentrated. So although I suggest we look at particular parts of the body, we can be with all the parts of the body. The listening, the feeling, the hearing, the seeing. But getting to see that it's quite different from how we normally are. We're normally carried away by our thoughts, views and opinions, our conditioning, our belief values. This is not just about uh, taking on a set of Buddhist beliefs. It's a path, it's a path to, to liberation to awakening, awakening to the way it is, liberation from our strong views and opinions, our conditioning. But as I keep saying, you know, there really is no reason why we cannot be aware right now. Formal meditation is really useful re-establishing, rediscovering that place, that place of open awareness. But it's very important to bring it in to our ordinary everyday life. Bring it into the eightfold path, into every aspect of our life. And then we're truly on the path, not the path of ideas and beliefs in somebody else's words. But the true path 
of Buddhist awakening. If we uh, do some more formal meditation, this time I'll keep fairly quiet. A couple of reminders just to uh, remind us because the mind tends to, uh, is very clever, tends to carry us away. Um, and perhaps add a little bit of investigation. And when I mean by investigation, I just mean by looking. Can I find a separate self? You know, ask yourself these questions in that present moment. Can I find anything that is lacking in this moment? Can I find a way to improve this present moment? Looking at these things or looking at you know, the, ba the basic teachings of the Four Noble Truths or Nietzsche Dukkha Anatta. But using these, never answer these questions. If you pose a question, don't answer it, because if you do, it's bound to be from a place of delusion. But if you ask the question and see it as a seed, so to speak, it will germinate when the conditions are right. And there'll be a true understanding, not just another intellectual uh, game that we continually play. Okay.
So remembering why you're here, making the most of this opportunity. Using the body, a part of the body, or the whole of the body, or the breath, or the sounds of the sound of silence. Not sticking to one thing if that doesn't suit. But move the attention around, move that awareness into different parts of the body, whichever is most helpful, whichever anchors the mind. But critically noticing how is it in this very moment.
So if the mind is starting to uh, wander more, which generally is the case after a while of sitting, just add a little bit more energy in the body, not to become, not to control the mind, but just to catch the mind. Once we catch the mind, once we see that it's wandering, we are automatically back in the present moment. There's nothing to get or gain or become here. There is just that awareness, noticing, noticing how the mind, how our conditioned mind tends to want to be in control.
If it suits you, if it's helpful to you, sweep through the body. Or find a place where there is extra energy, say in the, in the belly or the small of the back or in the hands. Or noticing the breath. Or listening. But always noticing. How is the mind, how is the heart mind when we are present? So does anybody have any questions or comments or criticisms or uh, It's always nice for me to know whether um, what I encourage is actually making any sense to anybody other than me. Um,
I can't hear you, Colin. Are you saying something? Yes. Yeah, right. I'm encouraging everybody to unmute. Uh, and in particular, uh, I'm asking Wondu, Wongdu to unmute everybody if he can. And Jeff has just put his hand up. Um, and can you unmute, Jeff? Can't, you're still muted, Jeff. Yeah. And I can't. Plenty of. Yep, yep, we've got it. <laughs> I can see your hand up. Wong Du, if you're still there. Wong Du. Uh, can, can, can other people, yeah, can other people unmute or not? Can you, can you all have a go at unmuting, please? I want to see if it's possible. Now everybody no. seems to be muted. No, no, Meg, thank you very much for indicating that. Okay, well, we, uh, I'm just seeing if I can do anything to help you. Uh, uh, How did you unmute, Colin? Uh, my psychic powers and a little button. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> A little, there's a little button bottom bottom left on my on my yeah. screen, yeah. Uh, and Wongdu, are you there? Somebody's Meg is saying Jeff could put it in the chat. That's a bit of a shame, actually, isn't it? It's much nicer to... Uh... It's interesting, Darren isn't uh, muted. No, I was just, I was just unable to, I was just able to unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, it's interesting that you've you've done it. Nobody else could do. Oh yeah, yeah you. Can you? Me too. Oh, Jeff, you're oh, online. Okay. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. So, did you have something to say, Jeff? Something? Yeah. Thank Thank you for being with us tonight. That's, that, that, that's very appropriate. That's very appropriate because I was going to mention the sound of silence. Um. I went on a course on a retreat with Amaravati last weekend mm. and there was some talk of the sound of silence and we were trying really to to focus on that. Yeah. And you mentioned it again tonight. Yeah. What I, what I get is like um, a sparkling tinnitus sort of feeling. Yes. Am I anywhere near? Uh, it's however it appears to you. <laughs> Oh, okay. You know, the, 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 some people uh, who have problems with tinnitus don't like it at all because they they, con they makes them concentrate on. But yeah, I mean, it can be for me. It's a sort of a it's a just a a, a natural buzzing type sound. It's mm. it's the thing is it's continually there, and uh. You know, you could you could be mowing the lawn or using a chainsaw and still hear it. Now, when you're listening to it, we are present. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's actually no different from being aware of any other part of the body. But for some reason, it suits me more than being with my feet. Although, you know, I'll I'll use whatever parts of the body are, are more noticeable. 
but it's you know and it's important to notice that when we are when we're listening to that sound the mind can't be anywhere else but within that sound we can think we can operate in our life it doesn't prevent us from doing anything it just stops stops the mind from wandering and this isn't about not thinking because we can think from that place but it's a it's a thinking with clarity it's not a you know an attached it's more of a, a clear thinking yeah uh, John when I when I um, I'm, I'm aware of this sound I can also hear everything else going on I mean I'm, I'm listening to silence but I can also hear the birds outside absolutely yeah it excludes see this is uh somehow um people have got into trying to concentrate on one particular thing but through this open spacious awareness yes of course there are there are birds tweeting away there's people talking there's dogs barking but we're present that spaciousness space contains everything you know it's like the space space contains this room i'm in space contains the whole world and it's very similar that's a very very similar way to put it that yeah it's it's not a concentrated thing it's a it's like an anchor it's keeping our feet on the ground so we can respond to life instead of reacting to life through our views opinions and attachments I can I can still hear it now while I'm talking to you. So absolutely, you. I yeah I'm listening to it now. I'm listening to it constantly, every time I remember. And but that doesn't mean to say I'm 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 not aware of the discomfort in my knees at the moment. But I'm not focusing. We tend to. It's like a car windscreen. You know, if you look at the, you're driving, you look at the, look at the dirt on the windscreen and you can't drive. But if you just look through it, you can drive normally. But the slight difference with the mind and the, and the windscreen is the, the mind is self cleaning, so to speak. The windscreen would just get dirtier. But we tend to, to focus in on the negative. We tend to focus in on on things instead of just being openly aware and seeing them for what they are, which is normally views and opinions, attachments. Thanks for the question, Jeff. Thank you. Does anybody else have uh, any questions? Nothing has come through in the chat box this evening. No. No, I think they've taken me all too seriously. <laughs> well, I... <laughs> um, may, I, may I ask a question? Please do. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Hello there. Um, thank you very much for talking to us this evening. Very interesting. Um, I'm a complete beginner to this. Um, okay. Yeah. I find the technique of scanning the body very useful in sort of centering yourself in the present moment. Mm. Is that unique to one particular form of meditation or is, or is that kind of a universal sort of thing that most Buddhists would practice? Um, people according to their own practice through the years, whatever, tend to suggest uh, this Anapanasati, which is uh, concentration on the breath, which can be very useful in, in calming the mind, um, or the Samatha, which is, is uh, calm, peaceful, open concentration, I suppose. And then there's Vipassana. I, I feel I'm more on the Vipassana side, which is the investigative side. So although I'm saying investigative, it's not 
through analyzing. It's just through looking clearly at the problem, so to speak. Not calling it a problem, but looking clearly and you start to see what's going on. So there are different techniques. Mm. My encouragement here is because what I've often, what I've seen over the years is people attach to the techniques and they think the techniques are the practice. The techniques are only pointing us towards the practice, but we tend to forget that. So that's why I'm so insistent or persistently carrying on with the same thing as get to know that awareness. Get, and then we can use the Anapanasati, we can be with the breath. We're not attaching to it. Like we're not concentrating, just being with it. Or you can be calm, settled in that place of samatha. Or we can be investigating, but we're not attaching to it. it we, we tend to just pick up another set of views, ideas and opinions and think I'm, I'm being a Buddhist or a whatever. But we just, we've just picked up another set of um, beliefs. Hmm. So, you know, I think it's useful to really find that place. Then we can we can go the way our, our, our nature pushes us, so to speak, in what suits us, what style of, of techniques or what style of teachings, whatever. So that's why I'm always doing the same old thing on that line. Okay, no, thank you. Very interesting answer. Thank you for that. Okay, Darren. Amita, are you looking? Uh... Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ajahn, for your teaching. Um, you know, um, now, sometimes when I live, all of a sudden my mind goes to nice silence and very peaceful moments come. But, uh, but, uh, so I'm not doing, I, I wasn't doing anything at that point. During that period, it just comes, and then I just listen. But if I try and do if if I try to meditate, so then it doesn't come like that. Yeah. I still can hear silence, but uh, that automatically comes is much more peaceful and. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think in truth, or the way I see it, is. We cannot meditate. It's impossible for a person to meditate because we can't fix the problem with the problem. And the problem is we're deluded. We're full of views and opinions and conditioning. So how can we meditate? But through this noticing, we can suddenly, there's a natural letting go into that moment. And then, it, oh, yes. Yeah. It's, there's a stopping, but it's not me stopping. It's not me meditating. It's a natural open because Buddhism is about letting go, not grasping. So as you say, that's the way it works. We suddenly, in a sense, forget, forget to struggle, forget to become something else, forget to meditate. And I don't mean forget by falling asleep, but there's a letting go. That's what I mean by forgetting. And then, well, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Thank you. Well, do you think that's it, Colin? Uh, it's really, if anybody else thinks it's... <laughs> Everybody else <laughs> seems to think that's it. <laughs> Is that it? We could just, it. There's, there's, I mean, there's endless things we could talk about. And actually, you've covered a lot of ground. And I particularly like what you've just been saying to in response to what people have been saying about 
but different, if you like, approaches to this practice. So if somebody's sitting there and they're peaceful and calm and they're not asleep, that's pretty good. Anyway, <laughs> you know, uh, how we got there is something else. And, it's, and talking about different techniques like the sound of silence or scanning the body, you know, or a mantra or whatever, um, it can be very helpful. Mm. Um, and but to keep an eye on, uh, it's it's all for me. It's all about the difference between, you know, the contents of the mind and the mind itself, or awareness and being aware of. It's that sort of thing. This is this is very interesting. Yeah. It's very interesting to do this. Yeah. So, I want to thank you again for leading the class, and. Um, the proof of the pudding is in the, in the sense of so many people are still here tonight. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for coming, of course, particularly you, Ajahn Barry. Uh, and um, do come again next week. Ajahn, oh, Ajahn Barry will be next back on the 25th, uh, the, the, the last uh, Thursday in May, the 25th. But the class continues. And next week, I can absolutely guarantee a special pre-coronation edition of the Thursday basic meditation class. So do come. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing you all. And uh, thank you again, Achan Barry, and thank you to Wongdu. Th there was some sort of temporary glitch, which we seem to have kind of overcome. That's very good. So thank you again, everybody. Take care in between now and next week. Yeah, thank I'd you. Just li I'd just like to say, please, just keep it simple. And going back slightly to what Colin said as well, we tend to attach to the techniques. Nothing wrong with the techniques. As they say in the Zen school, don't mistake the finger for the moon. The finger is pointing at the moon. It's not the finger. The technique is pointing, is pointing to that place of a natural letting go. It's not about the technique itself it's where it's pointing and this is where we need to look so don't forget to come back to the present moment and notice and i wish you all well take care everyone